the reading bug here with a super special message for the entire kingdom. Today's episode is sponsored by Random House Kids, publishers of incredible picture books like Grumpy Monkey by Susan Lang and illustrated by Max Lang. Grumpy Monkey is a wonderful book about a very grumpy monkey. The authors bring hilarity and levity to a very important lesson about expressing your feelings, helping kids learn it's okay to be grumpy sometimes and to have other feelings too, as long as you learn to handle them. And of course, it's always easier when you have friends by your side. Get Grumpy Monkey today at thereadingbug.com or your local independent bookstore. Hello, reader. Welcome to another Reading Bug adventure. This week, it's a bonus full story episode of our royal adventure to the Kingdom of Camelot. And it is also our very last episode of this season. But don't worry, we'll be writing and recording new music and stories and expect to be back for more Reading Bug adventures in the spring. Thank you for listening. Reading Bug Adventures is created, written, and produced by The Reading Bug, our family owned children's bookstore. Parents, there's still time to shop for the perfect holiday gift from The Reading Bug, and we appreciate your support. Order a Reading Bug box at readingbugbox.com right now. And if you purchase a six or 12 month subscription, you can make sure it gets there on time with a free expedited shipping upgrade for your first box with the code FASTSHIP. Reading Bug Box is a special and perfectly personalized gift to inspire a lifelong love of reading. Hurry and get one for every child on your nice list. Instead of shopping those big box retailers, help support independent businesses this holiday season. Thank you. Finally, before we begin our adventure, I need to say a few special thank yous. Our podcast is mixed and mastered by the awesome team at Resonate Recordings and is made possible by our sponsors and by listeners like you. To learn more about how you can help support us, visit our page at patreon.com. Thanks for making Reading Bug Adventures a success, and we're excited about the new adventures we'll have together next year. Okay, reader, are you ready for another adventure with me and the Reading Bug? Then what are we waiting for? Let's fly! It's time for a Reading Bug Adventure! It's a Reading Bug Adventure, there's lots of fun in store. Just inside our book bag, there's new places to explore. Grab your crayons and paper, and your imaginations too. The Reading Bug and I can't wait to share our trip with you. Hi, reader. Thanks for joining me. It's so nice to see you again. I've been thinking about our adventure all day, trying to figure out where the Reading Bug might be taking us. Do you have any guesses? Wherever we're going, I'm really excited to go. Now, where is the reading bug? She's not usually late for a big adventure. Oh, look, I think I see her flying this way. Reading bug, over here. Oh, hi, Lauren. Hi, reader. I'm sorry I'm just a little bit late. As usual, I got so caught up in the book I was reading that I completely lost track of time. It's not a problem at all, reading bug. We weren't waiting long, were we, reader? Reading Bug, we were just guessing where we might be going on our adventure today. Can you tell us what book you were reading? Is it a clue for our adventure? Of course it is. I'll tell you the title of the book, and you can see if you can guess where we'll be traveling. I was reading Castle by David McCauley. How's that for a clue? Any guesses? Hmm. Reader, do you have any guesses? Every week, the Reading Bug's magic book bag and the books inside take us on an adventure to a new time or place. But I'm stumped. I mean, clearly there's a castle involved. But I guess I'm going to need more clues. What else can you tell us, Reading Bug? I'll tell you the titles of a few more books in my book bag and see if that helps. Okay, Lauren? Let me see here. I've got Donuts and Dragons by D. Leon. King Arthur's Very Great Grandson by Kenneth Craggle, and the story of King Arthur and his knights, retold from the Howard Pyle original by Tania Zamorski. Any guesses yet? Hmm, not yet. Why don't you tell us a few more titles? I also brought Cavill and Camelot, A Dog in King Arthur's Court by Audrey Mackman, and The Knight and the Dragon by Tommy DePaula. Want to guess where we're going now? Oh, wow. That's a really exciting list of books, Reading Bug. What do you think, Reader? I'm still not completely sure, but it sounds like we're going to be visiting an old palace, 
the royal family inside, and maybe even the knights who protect it. Am I getting close? Yes, very close. That was a great guess, Lauren. We won't be visiting any old castle today, though. My magic book bag is going to take us back in time more than 1,500 years and all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to visit the enchanted kingdom of Camelot. Oh my, how exciting! But wait, I thought that Camelot was make-believe. I know we've had some fantastic adventures before, but how can we be traveling to a land that never existed? Well, Lauren, my magic book bag and your imaginations can take us anywhere. And Camelot isn't completely make-believe either. It's somewhere in between real life and make-believe. It's a legend. In Christmas in Camelot, I learned that a legend is a story that begins in reality, but then imagination takes over. As different people use their imaginations to add new parts to the story, the legend grows and changes, and it becomes even more incredible. So, Lauren, reader, today we will be traveling together through time and space to find Camelot. And when we get there, we will get to create our very own new parts of the story, which can then become part of the Camelot legend. That sounds enchanting. And I am so excited about the adventure, Reading Bug. I love reading about castles, kings, queens, princes, and princesses, not to mention the knights, magicians, and jesters, and all the dancing, jousting, and questing. Yes, Lauren, there are so many wonderful parts of Camelot legend. But don't forget that there are some pretty scary parts, too. Dragons, goblins, and trolls, evil wizards and witches, black magic, and much, much more. We'll need to be cautious and keep on the lookout for all of them as well. You're right, Reading Bug. I almost forgot about those parts of the Camelot legend. I can't imagine what it would be like to come face to face with a dragon. But if we do, we'll need to be prepared. Why don't we start off by stretching out our bodies so we're focused, strong, and nimble for our adventure ahead. Let's all stretch together, reader. That's it. Everybody stand up, unless you're buckled into your car, and wiggle our fingers and toes. Are you wiggling? Great! Now, stretch your arms up high over your head. Perfect. Stretch up high, touch the sky, crouch down low and wiggle your toes. Swing your arms from side to side, let's get ready to go. Stretch up high, touch the sky, crouch down low and wiggle your toes. Swing your arms from side to side, now we're ready to go. Lauren, reader, what do you think? Are you ready to start our adventure? Yes, I'm stretched out, focused, and ready to go. But before we all hop into your book bag, I want to make sure that you brought some crayons and paper with you. I have a feeling we'll be seeing a lot of incredible things in Camelot. Knights in shining armor, King Arthur and Queen Guinevere, the beautiful ladies-in-waiting dressed in their colorful gowns, the incredible castles and cathedrals, and more. And you're going to want to illustrate them as you imagine them. Just like the illustrations in our favorite books, pictures are how we can add new ideas, details, and adventures to the Camelot legend, and remember them even after our adventure ends. That's right. Once our adventure is over, we'll take time to listen to music and draw the pictures that are in our imaginations. But of course, you can color at any time by pausing our podcast. Okay, reader, are you ready to join me on an enchanted adventure to the kingdom of Camelot? Here we go. Look, reader, the reading bug is opening up her book bag. And there are pictures, stories, music, and more swirling around in there. I see so many beautiful pictures inside. There's a magnificent castle shrouded in the mist. And there goes a picture of a sword studded with white diamonds, green emeralds, and red rubies that looks like it's stuck right into a big rock. Look over there, reader. I see a handsome man and a beautiful woman wearing crowns and looking lovingly into each other's eyes. And a big round table with several knights in brown tunics seated around it. Oh, but I also see some scary things, just like the reading bug warned. Look, there's a giant troll 
and there's a big green monster with pointed ears and scary pointed teeth. Is that a, a, a dragon? Lauren, reader, let's travel to a kingdom that's two dreams away, where witches are horses that frolic and play, where King Arthur and Guinevere rule over the land with compassion, humility, and a loving hand. Let's hop three times, then into my book bag together. Ready? One hop, two hop, three hop, and we're in! Let's jump inside our book bag. What will we find there? Imaginations run away. What's in our book bag? Our trusty book bag. What will we learn about today? Oh, wow. Look what's happening, reader. As we move through space and time, everything is changing before our eyes. Our neighborhood has disappeared, and all I can see now is blue ocean everywhere. And in every direction I look, for as far as I can see. We must be traveling over the Atlantic Ocean. Wait, now in the distance, I see some islands. Little spots of land in the middle of the vast ocean. And we're getting closer and closer. Look there, reader. On the nearest island is a beautiful, tall castle, shrouded in the mist. It's the one that I saw in the book bag. It must be the castled city of Camelot. The castle is surrounded by dark green forests and meadows that are so green, they look like rugs spread across the land. And there are lots of open spaces, too. Look there, near the castle. I can see a jousting tournament. That's where two horseback riders ride at each other, and each one tries to knock the other one off his horse with a great big stick. And look there, heading toward the castle, I even see some knights in shining silver armor seated on brown, black, and white horses. The sun is reflecting brightly off all that armor. I wonder where they're headed. Oh boy, Lauren, reader, I think we've arrived in Camelot. The lights and pictures have stopped flashing, and everything is perfectly still. If you listen closely, you can hear the sounds of the ocean. Maybe we've landed on a beach somewhere. It's pretty quiet otherwise, though, isn't it, reader? There are no traffic noises, no TVs, no mobile phones, no airplanes. All I can hear is the ocean pounding against the shore, and some seagulls squawking loudly as they fly overhead. Hey, wait! <gasps> Is that water I feel on my toes? It is. Oh no! Raider, look! Water is pouring into the book bag all around us! We've landed on the beach all right, but a little too close to the water, it seems. Quick, everybody, climb out now before the water fills the bag! Great! Reader, are you out too? Reading bug, grab the bag before it floats away in the tide. Phew! That was close. We're still pretty deep in the water. Let's quickly move through this wet sand and water up to the shore. It's hard to walk in the wet sand, isn't it? My feet keep sinking deeper every time I put them down. Keep going, everyone. Lift your knees high as you move through the wet sand. Good job. Just a few more squishy, squashy steps, and we'll reach the dry part of the beach. Great! We made it, but I've never seen any place like this. It feels mystical here, almost magical. I guess that makes sense. The legends of Camelot are full of magic and wonder. Look, there's a light gray fog covering the white sandy beach, making it look like something out of a dream. And over there, to our right, there are towering rocky cliffs hundreds of feet tall, with small, fast-flowing waterfalls lacing their way down and into the ocean below. Oh, yes! What an amazingly beautiful place this is. The water around us is bright blue and spectacularly clear. Look! I can see the sparkle of a few fish swimming in the ocean as the sun reflects off their scales. And there, just above the beach to our left, is a thick forest of trees with a wide road leading in. I wonder where that road leads to. If we're in the right spot, and the magical landscape all around us definitely feels like the legends I've read, then that road must be the way to the kingdom of Camelot. What do you say, Lauren? Reader? Should we set off to see the famous castle? Oh, yes. 
I can't wait to see the legendary castle. But if we're all the way on the beach, at the edge of the island, it may be a pretty long walk. Reader, if you have the energy, I suggest we start walking right now. Reading Bug, could you tell us more about Camelot to keep our minds occupied on our long walk? Great idea, Lauren. Let's start moving. I've been reading a lot about Camelot, so I can fill you in as we make our way toward the castle. Arthur was the firstborn son of King Uther Pendragon, and was heir to the throne. However, when he was born, there was a lot of danger and trouble in the kingdom. So Merlin, the king's trusted advisor, told the king that Arthur should be raised in a secret place so that no one would know his true identity. The king agreed, and Merlin secretly took Arthur to the castle of Sir Ector, a friend of the king. No one, not even Ector, knew that Arthur was the king's son. Wow, so King Uther Pendragon was Arthur's father, and Sir Ector was the king's friend and Arthur's protector? And who was Merlin again? Merlin was the most powerful wizard in the kingdom. And when the king sent young Arthur away, Merlin became Arthur's protector. Then, not long after the king gave his son to Merlin, the king died. The whole kingdom was in turmoil, because with Arthur gone, there was no heir to the throne, no one to become king after King Uther Pendragon. Rival dukes and lords fought and fought over who should be the next king. But when they couldn't settle anything, they asked Merlin to find a solution, and he did. Merlin put a heavy metal block, called an anvil, on top of an enormous stone, and then stuck a beautiful jewel-encrusted sword right into it. Oh, right! The sword and the stone! If I remember, the inscription on the sword's blade read, Whoso pulleth out this sword from this stone is the rightful king of all England. Absolutely right, Lauren. And because Merlin was the most powerful magician in the kingdom, all the noblemen believed him when he told them that the sword was magic and that only the person who was fit to rule England would be able to pull it from the stone. Lords and dukes and other noblemen from all over England came to try to pull out the sword. But even the strongest could not move the sword, not even an inch. Wow. So where was young Arthur during all of this? Oh, right. Arthur was working as a servant for Sir Ector and his son, Sir Kay. Since no one could move the sword, after a while, everyone in the kingdom forgot about the sword and the stone, and with no king, England fell into ruin. Oh, no. Why didn't Merlin tell everyone where Arthur was so he could be king? Merlin knew it was still unsafe for Arthur, so he kept him hidden with Sir Ector until Arthur was 15 years old. During that time, Arthur and Merlin became very close, and Merlin tutored Arthur, teaching him that knowledge is often more powerful than brute force. One day, when Arthur was 15, Merlin finally brought him to the sword in the stone. A crowd had been assembled and was waiting anxiously. When Sir Ector's son, the brawny Sir Kay, tried to pull the sword from the stone, it did not budge for him. But when Arthur tried, the sword came out of the stone and Arthur was crowned King of England. Long live the king! What an amazing story, Reading Bug! Well, you know, the best thing, Lauren, is that that story is only the beginning of the stories about Camelot. There are thousands of books, plays, operas, movies, cartoons, comics, and games about King Arthur, Queen Guinevere, the Kingdom of Camelot, the Wizard Merlin, and King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table. I can't wait to learn more. And thank you so much for the story, Reading Bug. Time has flown by and we're much closer to the castle. But look there. We've reached a fork in the road. If we go straight ahead, there's a scary wooden bridge we'll need to cross. The bridge looks old and unsafe. The bottom is made of wooden planks with lots of space between them, and it's swinging back and forth in the wind. It's only wide enough for a single person to walk on, and the only thing to hold on to in order to keep from falling into the river are those two ropes on either side. I don't think I want to walk on that scary, shaky bridge, but it looks like it might be the only path that leads to the castle. There are paths to the right and the left, too. But I have no idea where they might take us. And look carefully across the bridge, reader. In the distance, I think I see the castle gates. Which means the Camelot may be directly in front of us. Only a short walk from the other side of the river if we use the bridge. Shh! Wait. Lauren, reader, do you hear that? Look! 
I think I see something coming toward us on the path to the right. Do you see it too? Should we hide? Oh yes, look, reading bug. I think we're safe. It looks like two young boys running toward us carrying, what, sticks? Oh, <laughs> no, wait, I see. They're pretending to ride horses. Each has a long broomstick between his legs with a wooden head and a rope mane nailed to the top of the broomstick to look like a horse. How fun. Let's see if they can help us get to the castle without having to cross that scary bridge. Yoo-hoo, yoo-hoo, over here. Hi there. Hello, young men. My friends and I were wondering if you could help us. My name is Lauren, and this is the reading bug, and this is our reader friend. Would you mind stopping to help us with directions? Do not fear small people in strange attire and ye tiny bug. We are knights in training, looking for adventure, and we will ride our horses as fast as we can to assist you. My name is Tristan the Tenacious, and this is my friend Gavin the Gleeful. How can we assist thee? Might there be a dragon that needs to be slayed? Ooh, huzzah, huzzah! I hope there is a dragon. What fun it is to slay dragons. Nay! Oh, kind young sirs, we are headed to Camelot, the castled city where King Arthur lives. And it looks like the bridge ahead may be the most direct way to get to the castle, but it sure looks scary. Do you know if there's another way to the castle? Why, thee are in luck, fair maiden. We live in Camelot, too. And yes, of course, there are other ways to get to the castle. If thee take the path to the right or the left, thee will eventually reach the part of the river that is shallow enough to wade through. The problem for thee is that the shallow part of the river is at least three kilometers from here. It's a long walk without strong and fast horses like ours. By my trough, the walk across the river is jolly good fun. There are rapids to dodge, slippery rocks that may cause thee to slip and fall, and occasionally a giant sea serpent to slay it. All things considered, reader, it sounds as if our very best way forward is forward. The bridge may be scary, but at least there won't be any sea serpents to slay. True, true, but Gavin, don't thee think we should tell Mistress Lauren about what lies ahead for them if they try to cross the bridge? Aye, of course. Lauren, have thee read the sign on the bridge yet? The path before thee is terrifying, but it will be glorious if thee make it across. So much jollity! The sign? No, I didn't see a sign. Let me look. Oh, there, sure, I can read it. It says, beware, Trowbridge the Troll lives here. And below that is scribbled something else. If thee cross the bridge without permission from me, thee will find thyself in a troll's tummy. As my name suggests, I am tenacious, which means that I never stray from the path that I have chosen. And unfortunately, my path is not thy path. Now that we have assured ourselves that there are no dragons that will slay thee, we must return to our dragon-slaying quest. No need to thank us, and perchance we will see thee anon in Camelot. How fun, how glorious, a ride through the kingdom to search for dragons. Huzzah, huzzah! My lady, we cannot tarry, but I will give thee my most prized possession, my most beauteous horse. Take it and prosper. Goodbye. Goodbye. But Tristan, Gavin, there is no dragon, but there is a troll. We still need your help. Oh no, they're gone. Reader, how can we possibly make it to Camelot without being eaten by the sea serpents or the bridge troll? I think we're on our own in this dangerous place. And unless we come up with a plan and quickly, we'll never make it to Camelot. Ew, ugh, what's that? Smell. Oh no. Lauren, look. I think we've been spotted. Just over there crawling up from beneath the bridge is a t troll. He looks just like the troll in the Three Billy Goats Gruff by Jerry Pinkney. He is big and green and very smelly. I can smell him all the way from here. He has dirty red hair matted to the top of his head with sticks and mud. 
He has small pointed horns sticking out of his giant pointed ears, and he has a mouthful of great big razor sharp teeth. Based on the looks of him, I think we'd better get his permission before we cross on the bridge. What did that sign say? Else we might find ourselves in the troll's tummy? Really? I don't know. But if you think so, wish me luck. Here I go. Um, Mr. Troll? Mr. Troll? Hi there, uh, sir. My name is Lauren, and my friends and I seek safe passage across your bridge. We come in peace, and we hope you'll let us pass right across. What do you say? Odds bonkins. Who be these creatures who have woken me from the nap? Well, we are human time travelers from the future, and our little bug buddy here is a ladybug. Oh, indeed. Me loves ermine beans and ladybugs. Prithen, give me a minute or two, and I'll be out to introduce myself to you. Lauren, reader, Trowbridge is calling me a ladybird because that's what people call ladybugs like me in some countries, including in England. You three, come hither. No, 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 not to the bridge, but closer to me, so we can shake hands. Mr. Troll, did you build this bridge yourself? Indeed, me did. And me built it for myself. Trolls do not like water, not a writ. That must be why he's so smelly. So, me built this bridge, the only bridge across this river, so that me do not have to get even me feet wet when me crosses over. Mr. Troll, we are so pleased that you love humans and ladybugs, but you're holding my hand rather tightly. Are you willing to share this very special bridge with us? Will you provide a safe passage across the bridge now? Oh, Ermin Boone, me thinks that you misunderstood me. Me loves ermine beans and little birds to eat. That is tremendous in the troll tunnel. Yum. <laughs> if they try to cross this bridge, me will catch and eat all of them. Me will eat the Lauren for breakfast, because breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And me will eat the reader for lunch with a big bowl of lamb stew. And after supper, me always likes a little something sweet and crunchy. That's when me will eat this little little bird. Mr. Troll, it sounds like we should find a different path to the castle. So we will take one of the other paths and be on our way. That is, if you will let go of our hands, you are holding on to us so tightly. For sooth, me is holding on to them because me plan is to gobble them up. Whether or not they'll try to cross me bridge. Reader, Reading Bug, how can we possibly get out of this pickle that we're in? The troll has us wrapped up in his giant green hands. Reading Bug, you are small enough to fly away, but Reader and I appear to be doomed. Lauren, it's one for all and all for one. I will never leave the two of you in the gnarly green hands of Trowbridge Troll. And remember when I said this troll looked like he was from the pages of the Three Billy Goats Gruff? Well... I have thought of a plan to help us escape by following the Billy Goat's lead. I call it the Billy Goat Gruff Play. Oh, I know that story. Three hungry Billy Goats eat up all the wild grasses on their side of the river. But the only way to cross over the river to eat the delicious grass on the other side is by way of a bridge that is guarded by a troll. Just like this troll. Here's what we're going to do. Okay, are you ready for the Billy Goat Gruff play, reader? Are you ready, Lauren? I'm as ready as I'll ever be. I sure hope this works, or we're in big, big trouble. Here we go. Uh, Mr. Troll, we understand that trolls like games, so we would like to challenge you with a contest. If you win, we agree to be your breakfast, lunch, and dessert. But if we win... You agree to let us cross the bridge without gobbling us up. Ooh, a game? Me likes to play games. And there are not many games that a lonely troll with no friends can play. Prithel, tell me more about this contest. Each one of us will try to cross the rope bridge. First the reading bug. 
Next, our reader friend, and finally, me. If we all make it safely across, you will let us go without eating us. But if even one of us does not make it across the bridge, we agree that you can gobble us all up. Will you accept our challenge? This is hardly a challenge for a big, strong, mean, and hungry troll like me. They are all so very small and weak, they will never make it across my bridge. Oh, me will accept the challenge. Okay, the first step of our challenge is you really have to let go of us. Phew, I can finally breathe again. Are you okay, reader? Okay, Mr. Troll, we're ready to play the game. The reading bug will go first. When she starts to run across the bridge, you will close your eyes and count backwards from 10 without following her. When you reach zero, you are free to open your eyes and try to catch her before she reaches the other side of the river. Okay, here I go. 10, nine, uh, what comes next? Um, eight. Seven. This is hard. That's six. Five. Four. Three, two, one, and zero. Here me come, ready or not. Hmm. Me know that this little bird is small, but me don't see her anywhere. Prizzle, point her out to me. Woohoo! Here I am, Mr. Troll. I'm already across the bridge. I decided to fly instead of run. And it was ever so much faster. You flew? But that's not fair. Oh, don't worry, big guy. You are so big and strong. You have two more chances to win this contest. Surely you can catch one of the others. But I didn't know that the little bird could fly. How am I supposed to catch them if they flies across the bridge? Me be really angry. But I know ermine beans don't fly. So get the rattle. To boo moo moo. Okay, Mr. Troll. We're sending our reader friend across the bridge. This time, count by tens to 100. And then you can try to catch reader. Godspeed and be careful, reader. Move quickly, but watch out for holes in the bridge. 10. 20. 30. This is hard, too. What comes next? Oh, uh, yes. A uh, 40. 50. Sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety, one hundred. Here me comes, ready or not. Wait, Mr. Troll, stop! Let me ask you, do you really need to wear yourself out chasing after our reader friend? You only need to catch one of us in order to eat all three. And every chase across that bridge increases the chances that you could fall and land in the water. Besides, I'm injured. See, a friend gave me this wooden horse to use as a crutch for my injured foot. Why don't you rest a while and wait for me to cross the bridge? Surely you can catch a slow, injured, oomen bean like me. Hmm, yes, me likes this idea. Trolls hurt running almost as much as the hurt water. Me will set this one out and catch the one that tries to cross with the injured foot. Reader! You're safely across the bridge? Great! It's my turn now then. Close your eyes and no peeking, Mr. Troll. Remember, you need to count to 10 before you start chasing me. Can you hear my walking stick click clacking over the wooden planks? Ha ha ha, yes, I sure can do. Slow ermine. One, two, three. That's breakfast for me. Four, five, six, ermines are deluxe. Seven, eight, nine, a little bird will test fine. And finally, ten. Time to eat you then. Ready or not, hear me comes. Okay, Lauren, reader, it's time for the Billy Goat Gruff Play. Hey, Ermin, why have you stopped running? Why are they turning around? And why is this reader friend back on the bridge too? Hey, ouch! Something is in my eye. Me can't see. That's right, you big stinky troll. Lauren, reader, I flew right into his eye, and now I'm heading for the other one. 
Ouch! Stop! I don't think he can see anything now. Mr. Troll, a ladybird in the eye is better than a ladybird in the stomach. At least as far as I'm concerned. Lauren, your turn now. Great work, Reading Bug. Now this walking stick is just the right size and length for me to reach out and take a whack at one of your stinky green toes. Ow! Oh, poor Trolley. Did I hurt your footsie? I certainly hope so. Whoa, whoa! Grab on tight, Reader. As the troll hops up and down, the bridge is starting to shake dangerously. Ah! My eyes hurt! Me thinks he broke my foot! And me am dizzled from all the swinging and swaying. Once me can see you again and steady myself, me is going to grab you and gobble you all up. Here me is, coming for you. Reader, it's your turn now. We just need you to give Mr. Troll one big push. Go! Whoa! Whoa! Oh no! Look, Lauren, it's the giant serpent that Tristan and Gavin warned us about. Quick, let's get to the other side of the bridge and hide. That serpent is even bigger than the troll and twice as scary looking. Why, hello. What do we have here? Who is that splish splashing in my river? It's only me, Trowbridge the Troll. Well, lucky me. I love trolls. And by that, I mean I love tasting them in my slimy, serpenty stomach. I've been waiting for you for a long time, Trowbridge Troll. And now, I'm going to gobble you up! We did it, friends! We made it across the bridge by using our brains and just a little bit of brawn. The evil troll is gone. Everyone in Camelot will be able to use the bridge now. And we're just a short walk from the castle. That sure was scary, but thanks for being so brave and helping us get past the troll. I think we should rest here for a while before we proceed to Camelot. We've already seen so much excitement. While you think about all the exciting things we've seen and done today, I'm going to pause our adventure here to give you a quick introduction to this episode's sponsor. Keep listening. We'll be right back. Today's episode is sponsored by Random House Kids and their picture book, Grumpy Monkey, by Suzanne Lang. Hey, Reading Bug, have you read Grumpy Monkey? It's terrific, isn't it? Ugh. Hm. I'm tired. Leave me alone. Oh, Reading Bug, you're not sounding like the happy bug I know. Are you grumpy? Wait, who are you calling grumpy? <laughs> Reading Bug, that sounds like something Jim Panzee says in Grumpy Monkey. Written by Suzanne Lang, illustrated by Max Lang, and published by Random House Kids. Jim is one grumpy monkey, even though he denies it. <laughs> You're right, Lauren. Maybe I am having a grumpy monkey kind of day. In the book, Jim Panzee's friend, Norman the Gorilla, tries to cheer him up by spending time with all their animal friends. But nothing seems to work, and Jim ends up yelling at those friends, which I learn is not the right way to deal with those feelings. It sounds like Grumpy Monkey taught you a valuable lesson. Yes. I learned that it's okay to be grumpy sometimes, and to have all kinds of other feelings too, as long as you don't hurt any of your friends. That's always easier with a good friend by your side. Thanks for being my good friend, Lauren. Of course, Reading Bug. At the Reading Bug Bookstore, we all recommend Grumpy Monkey as a wonderful, funny, and important book, and we're thrilled to introduce it to all of our listeners. You can buy Grumpy Monkey at thereadingbug.com or your local independent bookstore. And find out more about Random House Kids books by visiting rhcbooks.com. Thank you, Random House Kids, for your support. Hello, reader. You're back. Thanks so much for rejoining me and the Reading Bug on our way to the legendary kingdom of Camelot. Now that we've rested a while, after a very scary brush with the bridge troll... It's time to finish our walk to the castle. What do you think? Are you ready to go? Great! Reading Bug, while we walk, can you tell us some more stories about King Arthur and Camelot? Of course I can, Lauren. Where was I? Oh, yes. After Arthur became king, he assembled a group of knights around him. Maybe you've heard of them. 
The knights were called the Knights of the Round Table because they sat with King Arthur around a large round table in the Great Hall of the Castle. A round table? Why not a square or rectangular one? The table was round because Arthur wanted it to be clear that all of the knights were equal. And because they were equal, no one, not even the king himself, should sit at the head of the table. Wow, that's very humble of King Arthur. Yes. Lots of kings think they're better than everyone else, like in King Hugo's Big Ego by Chris Van Dusen. But King Arthur tried to promote equality and fairness throughout the kingdom. And why did the Knights of the Round Table become so famous? What did they do? The knights did what all great knights do. They rescued damsels in distress, slayed dragons, and fought against wicked knights who used their weapons to oppress the poor and defenseless. Those wicked knights were called recreants, which means something like cowardly bullies. One of my books, The Adventures of Sir Lancelot by Gerald Morris, says that one by one, the knights of the round table drove the recreants out of England, which led to a time of peace and prosperity for Camelot and for England. Wow. And I think I recall that the Knights of the Round Table had a code they lived by. Is that right? Yes, Lauren. The Knights pledged to live by the Code of Chivalry. That required them to be brave, intelligent, loyal to each other and to England, kind to the poor and the weak, courteous to all, and honest. And because the Knights were all equal, they pledged to always work together for the common good. Brave, intelligent, loyal, kind, courteous, and honest. Sounds like King Arthur assembled a wonderful team. It makes me think of a song I once heard. Very strange. Did you hear that, reader? Why can't I play my music? Let me try again. Reader, reading bug, what's going on? I can't seem to make any music at all on this island. You're right, Lauren. As soon as the music starts, something is stopping it. What on earth could be stopping our songs? You know, Camelot is a magical and mysterious place. Maybe this has something to do with magic. What kind of magic could stop music from playing, I wonder? Or why? Oh, hey, reading bug, reader. It looks like that question will have to wait, because look, we've reached the castle. It's beautiful. A massive, towering structure right in front of us with high stone walls and towering turrets. There's a huge wooden door just ahead that may also be a drawbridge, since there's a moat with water all around the castle. Look, the walls of the castle are big and solid, but there are a number of small rectangular holes in the wall. It looks like the wall was built that way. What do you think those holes are for? Oh, oh, I know the answer to that. The holes are called arrow loops and they are used by people inside the castle to shoot arrows at any enemies outside of the castle who try to enter without permission. And do you know what the big moat is for? Well, I suppose the moat is to stop enemies from attacking the castle too. Yes, but maybe not quite the way you'd think. Moats were built around the castle to stop attackers from digging tunnels to go underground to get to the castle. When enemies tried to dig a tunnel under the moat, the weight of the water in the moat caused the tunnels to collapse. Uh-oh. Don't look now, but we're being watched. There are towers on either side of the gate to the castle with several guards in each of them. See? We need to think very quickly, reader, or we may find ourselves on the pointy side of an arrow flying at us from an arrow loop in the castle wall. Hark! Who comes to Camelot? Be ye friend or foe? Why, hello there, Mr. Guard. My name is Lauren, and this is the reading bug and our reader friend. We are time travelers from a distant time, and we are friends for sure. We come in peace to meet King Arthur, Queen Guinevere, and the Knights of the Round Table. Salutations, travelers. My name is Harold, and I am a guard and a herald for the King and Queen. Be our friends, ye say. Well, ye look harmless enough, but we have heard stories that thy small band of travelers has slayed the troll under the bridge. If that be true, methinks thee may have come to overtake our castle as well. On the ready, guards, don't let these troll slayers pass, lest ye encounter the same fate as Trowbridge the Troll. No, wait. Did you say you were Harold the Herald? 
Yes? Born, Harold the Herald is a character in one of my favorite Camelot books, The Adventures of Sir Givret by Gerald Morris. A herald is an officer of the royal court who carries the king's messages to his knights and his subjects. In that story, Harold reminds me of another character you may have read, Fancy Nancy. Just like Nancy, Harold loves to use fancy words, especially French words, just like Nancy. Oh no, Warren, look, those are arrows sticking out of the arrow loops and pointing at us. Do something, say something, quick, before they send those arrows flying at us, and say it fancy. Fancy? Uh, okay, I'll try. Um, nay, nay, I implore you to, uh, pause. Please believe me, sir, your most humble servant. We are amicable visitors, that means friendly, on a legendary quest here to explore Camelot and, er, uh, perchance to rendezvous, that means meet, with the king and the queen and the knights of the round table. While we acknowledge that we conquered the troll who lived beneath the, um, aqueduct, it is because we had no other recourse. The troll announced to us that his stratagem was to eat all of us. We learned from your King Arthur that using strategy and knowledge in battle is often better than using brute force. Thus, drawing on our interpretation of the story of the Three Billy Goats Gruff, we were able to use our wits to overcome the troll, despite his greater brawn and strength. Impeccably stated. Tremendously expressed. What eloquence of language and purpose. I'm impressed. My friends, I say, huzzah! Well done, well done, well done indeed. And how very valiant and Intrepid of all of ye, I am certain that King Arthur and Queen Guinevere will be quite pleased with this development. They told me to invite the brave warriors who slayed the troll to join them in the great hall, but only if I found thee to be affable and gregarious. And affable thee are! Men, set down your bows and arrows and take down the drawbridge, so that these honored warriors can enter the castle walls. Oh my goodness. Look around, reader. Inside the castle walls is even more incredible than outside. There's so much space in here and so many people, buildings, animals, and more. I thought the inside of a castle was like the inside of a house, rooms filled with people and furniture, but it's not like that at all in here. That's right, Lauren. There's a lot more than living quarters inside a castle's walls. Look, food is grown in here, right there in the middle of the courtyard. Do you see the rows of green plants filled with red and yellow tomatoes? The big green zucchinis and orange and yellow squash ripening on ropey vines stretching throughout the garden. And the beautiful fruit trees filled with red and green apples, bright orange pomegranates, and dark red cherries. And just over there, there are brown and white spotted cows and woolly white sheep grazing. There are also prisons, training grounds, kitchens, grain stores, living quarters, blacksmiths, and more here inside the massive castle walls. Warriors, or should I say, Le Guerriere, follow me as we enter the Great Hall together, where King Arthur and Queen Guinevere are convening the Knights of the Round Table, and where thee will encounter his and her majesty. This way. This isn't how I imagined the indoors to look either. It's very cold and very dark in here. It's so dark because the windows are very, very small. And look, the floors below our feet are bare stone or covered with animal furs, like in the room over there to our left. There isn't much furniture in here, and what little there is, is very plain. A few wooden tables and wooden chairs. And the only light comes from the tiny window and a few flickering torches. I always imagine palaces as being luxurious, not dark and unwelcoming like this. 
Me too, Lauren. But then I read that back in the early Middle Ages, palaces were not as comfortable as we might imagine them. Fireplaces had not yet been invented, so the only heat came from open fires that generated a lot of smoke, and furnishings were very sparse. The castle is also really stinky, because they don't have any bathrooms like we have today. P.U. My Lord King Arthur, King of the Britons, my lady, Queen Guinevere, noble knights, avec votre permission, let me announce the arrival of our lion-hearted and audacious warrior guests. Huzzah! Lauren, reader, I think we need to curtsy or bow to show our respect to the king and queen. Are you ready? Let's do it now. Great. Welcome, brave warriors, and now, dear friends. My kingdom is indebted to thee for slaying the troll who kept my subjects from using the only bridge to the castle. Huzzah! Huzzah, indeed! Is there anything that we can do to repay thy chivalrous act? Oh, thank you so much for your kind words. We are not worthy of the praise, but we so appreciate your hospitality, and we're all delighted to have this opportunity to meet you. I do not have any requests for you, and there is no need to repay us for outwitting the troll. But standing in front of you now, I would be honored to present you with a song. Oh no, it's happening again. One more try. Your Highness, what strange magic is this that I cannot create music for you? The reading bug and I had the same trouble on our journey here. And oh, look at your faces and those of the knights. You're all so... Sad. Have I done something wrong? Have I offended you? What has happened that made you all so sad? Young Lauren, in addition to being brave, you are also remarkably perceptive. In Camelot, we have suffered a great tragedy. My half-sister, Morgan Le Fay, has placed a curse upon our island. Oh my! Lauren, reader, I've read about Morgan Le Fay in Dragonslayer Academy. She is the most powerful witch in the world. Those who know her say that she is so mean that if a rattlesnake bites her, the rattlesnake dies. Why would she place a curse on Camelot? Morgan asked me to make her son, Sir Baudemagus, a member of the Knights of the Round Table. But I would not do it because he does not represent the code of chivalry that all of my knights must pledge to follow. Placing a curse on Camelot was Morgan's revenge. What is the curse? The curse is that forevermore, there will be no music on our island or in our castle. No music? That's terrible. Oh no, we love music. That is correct. When my husband's sister placed the curse on our island, we did not realize how horrible it would be. As time drags on without music, we, as well as our subjects, have become sad and depressed. Even our court jesters just won't jest anymore. Music has always surrounded our people. The songbirds in our gardens, mother's lullabies to the children, children singing songs as they play games in the bright spring sunlight. Even the lowliest or poorest peasant takes part in these simple activities that bring so much joy. In our churches, People sing songs for weddings, funerals, and to celebrate our religious holidays. Wandering minstrels play drums and lutes, bells, jingles, naders, tambourines, and tampany, and sing songs and ballads about love or great courage in battle. And in our palace, we celebrate tournaments, holidays, and festivals through music and dance. Oh, how we all miss the music that used to fill our days. King Arthur, Queen Guinevere, is there any way to end this curse that has placed such a dark shadow over your kingdom? Alas, the answer to thy question is nay. When she placed the curse, Morgan said that it could only be lifted if Guinevere and I became parents to a son who can inherit my throne. There is nothing that Arthur and I want more than to become parents, but I have been unable to bear a child. Now, now, Guinevere, I'm afraid it is true. We are unable to have a child of our own. 
Oh. Uh, but pardon me, your highnesses. If the curse is lifted when you become parents, and if you really want to have a child to cherish, I think there may be another way for you to become parents and lift the curse. Have you ever considered adoption? Adoption? Arthur, have thee heard of this adoption? Prithee explain. Neither of us is familiar with this term. Oh, right. Lauren, adoption barely existed in this time. Not like in our time, where it is an important part of our modern culture. Queen Guinevere, adoption is when people love and raise a child who is not born to them as their own. A child who may not have parents of his or her own, that is able to raise them or care for them. Adoption. Adoption. <laughs> Arthur, what a wonderful word. Lauren, there is so much love in our hearts, and we're so eager to share it with a child. I am sure that our son is living right here on this island for us to adopt. Arthur, we just need to find him. Indeed. Quickly, tell the royal staff to get to work. We must gather all orphan boys on this island to participate in a contest. The contest will help us find the rightful heir to the English throne. And a lad we will love more than life itself. Brilliant idea, Arthur. Just as you became king when you successfully pulled Excalibur from the stone, the boy must prove his worthiness to lead England. We shall divide the contest into three tasks. First, to test their bravery. The lad shall cross the lake of enchantment, and the lady of the lake must decide to give one of them her magical sword, Excalibur. I learned in the story of King Arthur and his knights by Howard Pyle that the lady of the lake is named Nimu, and she is a powerful water nymph who lives in the lake of enchantment. In some legends, she is very good. For example, Nimu gave Excalibur to Arthur and she raised the most famous knight of the round table, Sir Lancelot, after his father's death. But in other stories, she is evil. Second, to test their intelligence, the lads must search for the elusive white stag that King Arthur has been hunting all these years. Lauren, I read that the white stag is associated with mythology and legends. The stag often appears in the forest around King Arthur's court, but has never been captured. Yes, yes! And finally, the rightful heir must pull Excalibur out of the stone, just like I did so many years ago. Lauren, reading bug, reader, as brave warriors and as friends, you shall accompany the contestants on their journeys, lending your guidance and judging their bravery, cunning, and strength as they compete. And you shall accompany them as Knights of the Round Table. Knights? Knights. <gasps> Us? That's right. Each of you has displayed bravery, intelligence, loyalty, kindness, and honesty. We are honored to have thee join our ranks. To become knights, all of thee must kneel before me. Down on your knees, just like that. What a great honor, your majesty. Reader, Lauren, quick, join me kneeling before King Arthur. Now, do not fear, but I will pass my sword over your head to knight each of you. First, reading bug. To honor your thirst for knowledge, your wisdom, and your sense of adventure, I knight thee, Sir Reading Bug the Reliable. Huzzah! <laughs> Now, Lauren, for thy kindness and for thy compassion for friends and strangers alike, I knight thee, Sir Lauren the Loyal. Huzzah! And reader, for thy bravery in the face of grave danger, thy curiosity and love of learning, and for thy friendship, I knight thee, Sir Reader the Resolute. Reading Bug the Reliable, Reader the Resolute. Can you believe it? We've joined the Knights of the Round Table. And not a moment too soon. Look, the orphan boys are beginning to arrive in the courtyard. 
We must make haste to begin our contest, find our adopted son, and lift the curse that Morgan Le Fay placed on our kingdom. Look, reader, crowds of people from across the kingdom are already gathering to watch the contest. Finally, people are smiling and enjoying themselves, even though there's still no music. It looks like a circus without the wild animals in the big tent. I see a puppet show over there, a magic show next to that, and even a bunch of jugglers. Jugglers? Remember how I learned to juggle when we went on our circus adventure? I think I'll fly over to see if those jugglers want me to join them. Don't leave now, Reading Bug. I see three young orphan boys who have come to participate in the contest, including our friends Tristan and Gavin. Remember them? They're the two boys we met when we first arrived here. Let's go say hello. Tristan, Gavin, hi. Do you remember us? You answered all of our questions when we first arrived in Camelot and were deciding whether to cross Trowbridge the Troll's Bridge. Do dragons have scales? Do warhogs have warts? Hello, of course we remember the brave warriors. We have heard how you deftly slew the troll and rescued the bridge from his control. How fun, how exciting. Huzzah, huzzah! Oh, but I didn't realize you were orphans. Yes, tis true. We have joined the contest, as sadly, we both lost our parents to the smallpox. Lauren, reader, smallpox was a very contagious disease in the Middle Ages, but thankfully it has been completely eradicated in modern times. That means it no longer exists. Oh me, oh my! I am so curious about what rewards might be earned by the winner of this contest. I hear rumors that the winner will become a knight in training. Wait a second. Tristan, I'm confused. I thought that you and Gavin were already knights in training. That's what you told us, isn't it? Well, we may have exaggerated a bit about our positions in the castle. We are not knights in training yet. We are kitchen aides who clean the dishes, set the fires for the cooks, and when needed, get rid of the rats who make their way into the kitchen. But we have always dreamed of becoming a knight in training, and when we're not working, we often make up our own training exercises in the hope that one day we will become official knights of the round table. Yes, and we're such close and loyal friends that Tristan and I have pledged to work together to win the contest and earn the reward. How fun today will be. It should be a wonderful adventure, and we're excited to be able to join you. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Welcome to the tournament called by King Arthur and Queen Guinevere. The winner of this tournament will become the adopted son of King Arthur and Queen Guinevere, trained to become a knight of the round table and become the rightful heir to King Arthur's crown. Three orphaned lads have come forward today to compete in the king's contest. Gavin the Gleeful, Tristan the Tenacious, and Sabin the Small. Sabin the Small? We haven't met him before. He must be the tiny, lonely-looking boy over there. Our queen has decreed that the contest will be a triathlon. To win one part, the contestants must demonstrate their bravery by crossing the Lake of Enchantment. The Lady of the Lake must find him to be worthy by his bravery and purity of heart to receive the sword Excalibur and bring it back to lay it at the feet of the king and queen. To win part two and proceed to part three, the contestant must demonstrate his intelligence by finding the white stag that King Arthur has been searching for lo these many years and lead the stag back to the king and queen. Legend has it that the person who captures the magical white stag may kiss the fairest maiden in the land. Since we all know my wife Guinevere is the fairest maiden in the land, I want to be sure that I am the only man who captures the stag and kisses the maiden, my beautiful wife. It is possible, although unlikely, that more than one contestant could win parts one and two. But our third challenge can only be won by a single contestant, the rightful heir to the British crown. Just as King Arthur pulled Excalibur 
out of the stone many years ago to prove that he was the rightful heir to King Uther Pendragon. The contestant who wins part three must pull Excalibur out of the same stone to prove that he is the rightful heir to King Arthur. Isn't this exciting, reader? A contest to determine who will become the adopted prince and rightful heir to the throne. Now that we are part of the legend of the Knights of the Round Table ourselves, I wouldn't want to miss a second of this, would you? Look out at the lake in front of us, reader. It is so beautiful and so blue, sparkling in the sunshine. And my goodness, in the very middle of the lake, look! There is an arm rising right out of the water, holding a sword! That hand must belong to the Lady of the Lake, and the brilliant sword must be Excalibur. Yes, Excalibur is a legendary sword with magical powers. The handle or hilt is crusted with sparkling jewels, green emeralds, red rubies, white diamonds, black and blue pearls, and more. To win part one of this contest, the queen has decreed that all contestants must cross the lake of enchantment, prove that they are worthy to receive the sword Excalibur from the hand of the lady of the lake, and return to shore with the sword. The lad who returns with the legendary sword will be declared the winner. There is a single small boat with paddles at the edge of the lake, so it doesn't seem very hard for the first contestant to reach the boat, to jump in and paddle out to get the sword. It's not that easy, Lauren. I read in the story of King Arthur and his knights by Howard Pyle that the sword is inscribed with a warning. No man may win that sword except he who is beyond fear and blame. So, in order to be able to get the sword, the lad must be both brave and pure of heart. And the Lady of the Lake, who holds the sword, is a very powerful witch. She has declared that no one who enters the lake can leave it alive if he is not pure of heart. Reader, we know Gavin and Tristan, and they seem pretty brave for their age, but we've never met Sabin the Small before. I wonder how he'll fare against the Lady of the Lake. Sabin is the lonely looking boy just over there. And look, everyone here seems to know Tristan and Gavin, and they're cheering them on. But I don't think Sabin has anyone cheering for him. Following our contestants and judging their chivalry will be these three brave warriors, victors over the nasty Trowbridge Troll and newly knighted Round Table Chevalier. Sir Reading Bug the Reliable. Sir Lauren the Loyal, and Sir Reader the Resolute. Oh, Reader, Reading Bug, that's us! We'll need to follow the boys and judge their actions and activity. Contestants, take your marks. Get ready, get set, go! Gavin, quick, follow me! Let's run quickly to the boat so we can get there before Sabin. Okay, let's go. Whee! Gavin, Tristan, careful. The Lady of the Lake can be dangerous. Being fast and brave won't be enough. You'll also need to prove that you're pure of heart. Thanks for the tip, Reading Bug. We'll see you when we're back with Excalibur. Oh no, Tristan, look. Sabin must have thought he could beat us by skipping the boat completely. He has jumped into the lake and trying to swim. Oh, wow, that's incredibly brave of him. Tenacious, even. But, oh, no. Look, Gavin, there's something moving across the lake towards him. The serpent. Sabin will never make it out of the lake unless someone saves him from this slimy, slithering serpent. Lauren, reader, reading bug, we have to help Sabin. If we all paddle the boat together, I think we can reach Sabin before the serpent does. Quickly, can you help? Of course we can, Gavin. Right, reader? Lead the way. Quickly, everybody, into the boat. Great, now grab a paddle and paddle as hard and as fast as you can. Reading bug, can you control the rudder so we're aimed right at Sabin? Got it. Okay, now, row, 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 row. Great work, we're catching up quickly. Row, 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 row. Keep paddling. Row, 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 row. We're here, 
here, but we need to move quickly. The serpent is almost here too. Sabin, quick, hop in the boat. There is an angry, ugly serpent with large, spiky teeth on this way, even as we speak. But no questions, into the boat. Good work. Now let's row like our lives depend on it, because they do. Row, 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 row. Raider, keep paddling as fast as you can. The serpent is coming out of the water behind us. I thought I was going to get to eat another delicious meal today. Tender little boys taste delightful after a heavy meal of troll. Phew, that was a close call. And look, everyone, we've made it to the middle of the lake. Thanks for the rest, you guys. You can go ahead and get Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake. I never made it here without you. No way, Sabin. We'll get the sword together. That was incredibly brave, trying to swim across the lake to beat us here. And you deserve it, too. I agree. Lady of the Lake, may we take Excalibur from you? Tristan the Tenacious, Gavin the Gleeful, Sabin the Small. Today you have all shown incredible bravery, working together to make it across the lake to me. Sabin, without your friend's loyalty and compassion, you would not have made it to me. And Gavin and Tristan, it was Sabin's courage and creativity that spurred you to action and carried you so quickly across the water. Your acts of kindness and compassion have demonstrated that each of you is pure of heart. I will, therefore, give the sword to all three of you, and I can assure you that you will have no problem returning to the shore. Huzzah! Great work, everyone! Wow! Feel the sword! It sure is heavy! Quickly, back to the shore! Row, row, row! Row, row, row! Row, row, row! Yeah! Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes! The first part of our contest is now complete, as required by the code of chivalry that governs our king and his round table. These three contestants have proved their bravery by accepting the challenge to pull the sword from Nimu's hands. Each of them has proved their loyalty by working together to accomplish their goal instead of selfishly seeking to be the only winner. And because their actions demonstrated that they were pure in heart, they were able to leave the lake and take the sword to King Arthur and Queen Guinevere. Sabin the Small showed great bravery, might, and speed Gavin the Gleeful showed loyalty and compassion, taking quick action to save young Sabin, and Tristan the Tenacious proved pure of heart, thinking not of his own success, but of the safety of his fellow contestants. All three have been declared winners of this round one of the contest. But lest ye thought the competition was over, we now move to part two. In this challenge, each contestant is tasked with capturing and returning the elusive white stag that has evaded even King Arthur. The white stag has frequently been spotted, but never captured, in the dense forest behind us, and if you look carefully, you may just catch a glimpse of him yonder. Oh, wow! Born reader! Look just ahead of us in the thick of the forest. Do you see that glowing light? That must be the white stag. The white stag is associated with mystery and good luck, and often appears in the forest around King Arthur's court. And according to the adventures of Sir Givret by Gerald Morris, the knight who captures the white stag earns the right to kiss the fairest damsel in the world. But you heard even King Arthur has not been able to capture the white stag. If the great king can't capture it, how can one of these young boys possibly stand a chance? Gavin, Tristan, and Sabin, when I say go, these shall run into the forest in search of the elusive white deer. Sir Reading Bug, the Reliable, Sir Lauren, the Loyal, and Sir Reader, the Resolute, will follow and judge on behalf of the King and Queen. On your marks, get set, go! Yeah! They're off! Lauren, Reader, quickly! 
quickly! Let's follow the boys into the forest! Gavin, follow me. Let's try to capture the white stag together. We work exceptionally well as a team. But Hark, we must proceed as quietly as mice if we are to catch him. I am sure that together we can bring the magical beasts back to King Arthur. Prithee, look ahead. Do you see the glowing white object beyond the stand of oak trees? In this dark forest, there can only be one shimmering white ore. It must be the magical, mystical white stag. Careful, Gavin. Don't get too gleeful. If the stag sees us, he's certain to run away. But how should we capture him then? By the time we are able to reach the oak trees, I am sure he will have seen us and disappeared into the forest. Would that I were fleeter of feet. By faith, Gavin, I am known to be tenacious, and I am also very fast. I shall race ahead of you and reach the shining stag as quickly as you can say, Tristan the Tenacious, three times. But then what? Even if I reach him, how will I be able to keep him from running away? Huzzah, huzzah, Tristan. It's nearly time to celebrate our victory. Look here. I always bring a sturdy, long, white rope with me in case we find a dragon to detain or a sea serpent to be snared. Good luck indeed, my friend. I shall take your rope and tie it around the stag's mighty neck. Oh, but Tristan, that stag is easily larger and stronger than both of us together. Once you have the rope tied, how will we be able to move that stag back to the king and win the contest? Excuse me, I might be able to assist you. Oh, goodness. Hi, Sabin. You startled us. You came upon us as quiet as a mouse. Yes, hello to thy. Gavin, Tristan, I was listening to your plan, and I believe I can help, if you'll let me. You saved me in the first contest, and I would like to repay the favor now. Thanks, Sabin. But the stag is mighty, and you are so, well, small. How could you possibly help us move him? I'm used to working with skittish animals who scare at a heavy footstep. That's why you didn't hear me approaching. I tend to a herd of sheep owned by a farmer in the village. Well, I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I live with my sheep. They're as close to family as I ever have. I've named each of them, and I love them all. Sheeps are stubborn, and it requires a soft touch to get them to follow you. Brute force will cause a sheep to fight you harder. But with soft words and kindness, a sheep will follow you anywhere. So what? You're going to whisper to the stag to get it to follow you? Something like that. Yes, trust me. I think it will work, and when it does, a gentle pull of your rope is all it will take for the stag to follow you. Okay, then. What a plan. We'll work as a team to catch this stag and bring him to the King Arthur. Gavin, I'll take thy rope with me. By the time you say my name three times, I'll be lassoing the stag. Once I've got him, Sabin, you can do your sheep whispering to get him to move. How wonderful! How fun! Godspeed, my friend! And go! Reader, look! Tristan is fast! He sure is! Say his name with me three times, and I assure you he'll have that stag just as he said. Tristan the Tenacious! Tristan the Tenacious! Tristan the Tenacious! I've got him! Gavin! Sabin! Hurry! Reading bug! Reader! Quick! Let's go see what Tristan has caught! Oh, look, reader, it is the white stag. What a beautiful beast. The stag is pure white, so white that the sun's rays make him glisten like a precious jewel. And apart from his bright white color, he looks like one of Santa's reindeers, but extremely tall and muscular. His nose glows like a diamond, and his antlers are also very large, very regal, and they look like they might be made of pure gold. Gold. Okay, saving the sheep whisperer. Do your thing. Okay, shh, there, there. Dear stag, precious jewel of the wood. My name is Saven, the small and the good. Will you please come with me to meet my king? He treasures you above everything. I promise to treat you with kindness and care, as do Tristan and Gavin, my two brothers here. 
So please will you follow us out of the woods? So ask I, your friend, saving small and the good. Incredible! Look, this stag is moving. Sabin, you did it. We did it. All of us together. Quickly, back to King Arthur. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes! Look, it's the white stag. Tremendous! Once again, all three lads are returning. Sabin the small, Gavin the gleeful, and Tristan the tenacious, walking hand in hand, the stag following willingly behind them. But prithee, which of you captured this mighty beast? Surely one of you shall be crowned the winner of part two of our contest. No, no, no your majesty. majesty. We work together as a team. Your Majesty, as judges, we saw everything, and the three boys most certainly worked as a team. Tristan, Gavin, and Sabin used their intelligence to devise a plan to capture the stag with kindness. Then, Tristan used his speed and tenacity to quickly reach the stag before he could run away. Gavin gleefully contributed his rope to their joint effort so that Tristan could tie it around the stag's neck. And Sabin used kindness and compassion to gain the stag's trust and convince him to follow the lads back to you. They worked chivalrously together to complete this task. My word, how remarkable. Once again, there is a three-way tie. All contestants have been declared winners of part two of the contest. Incredible! As all knights of the round table have pledged to do, Tristan, Gavin, and Sabin did not compete with each other, but instead used their intellect to achieve a common goal. And they have demonstrated their gentleness by capturing the stag through kindness rather than with brute force. Congratulations to each of you. The contest remains tied. My loyal subjects. It has now come time for the third and final challenge of our competition. This challenge has great significance, as currently all three of these brave lads are tied for the lead. Oh my, which of these three boys is going to win? Of course, you recall that many years ago, my friend, the court magician Merlin placed a magic spell on a sword placed in a stone such that the sword could only be removed by the true heir to England's throne. Whoso pulleth out the sword of the stone and anvil is rightwise king born of all England. The inscription on the sword read, No one, including me, knew that it was I who was the rightful heir until that day I pulled the sword from the stone. And likewise, these lads shall not know if they are the heir, adopted son to your queen and myself, until they complete this last feat, removing my sword, Excalibur, from the same stone here in front of us. Lauren, Peter, look, it's Excalibur again, but King Arthur has stuck it deep into the stone in front of him. Which of you wants to go first? Me, oh me, oh me, your majesty. Let me go first, please. I'm so excited. I feel very strong today. And surely I will be able to pull the sword out of the stone. <laughs> very well, young Gavin. Your glee is infectious. <laughs> Thank you for bringing such high spirits and enthusiasm to the challenge today. And good luck. Good luck, Gavin. You've got this. Okay, here I go. <sighs> I give up. That sword is stuck. I just can't budge it at all. Darn, and I really wanted to win, too. Gavin, you gave it your best shot. You should feel really proud. Yeah, that was a great try. Thanks, guys. I'm sure one of you can get up there and unstick that sword. Good luck. Your Majesty, I would like to go next. I know that Gavin is strong and enthusiastic, but I am much more tenacious. 
with a little extra bit of oomph and a whole lot of muscle. I am sure I can remove this sword and win the contest. Of course, young Tristan. Your courage, confidence, and tenacity are admirable, and we're all pulling for you to succeed. Thank you for your hard work today, and good luck! You got him, Tristan! Okay, a little warm-up first. Urgh. And here we go! Urgh. Oh no! I, I, I just can't do it either! I think it's impossible! Great try. I told you it was tough. Yeah, you really gave it your all. Pretty sir, I know I'm really small, but I would now like a chance to pull the sword out of the stone, if you will let me. <laughs> Don't listen, listen to, to them, Saban. Before I approach the sword, I have one request. Can I speak privately for a moment with thee, King Arthur? Well, well, young Saban. Despite thy small stature, you have proven to be big on ideas, curiosity, and innovation. I am extremely curious about what thee have to say. Of course thee can speak with me in private. I can? Oh, thank you so much! Look, reader, what's happening? Sabin and King Arthur have stopped talking and Sabin is walking to the stone with King Arthur. What could they possibly have discussed together? Even stranger, King Arthur, not Sabin, is grabbing Excalibur at the top of its hilt. And Sabin is grabbing the sword too, just below the king's hand. Are you ready, sir? If we both pull together, on the count of three, I think we can pull the sword loose. One, two, three... <laughs> You did it! You removed the sword from the stone! You're the winner! I knew you could do it, Sabin. What an ingenious idea to ask for help from King Arthur. There were no rules to preclude us from seeking help. But what did you say to King Arthur to convince him to help you? Ah, good question, lads. Twas magic. Magic? Sabin is a magician? No, no. Sabin is no magician. He simply remembered to use the magic word when asking for my help. Please. It is a word that demonstrates courtesy, another part of the Code of Chivalry. Arthur, my heart and soul, I believe we have found our son and the heir to the throne. We shall be parents after all. The curse is lifted. Your Majesty, pardon the interruption. But if the curse is lifted, why do I still not hear any music? No birds singing, no instruments playing, no lullabies being sung. Listen. Your Majesties, I'm afraid I need to share a small secret with thee. I wanted desperately to find parents. Like thee, I have so much love to give, but no family to share it with. But my desire forced me to not be honest with thee which I now regret. Not be honest? My dear boy, what could you possibly mean? Here, let me take off my cap and show thee. <gasps> my name is not Sabin the Small. It's Sabine. Reader, look. Sabin, er, Sabine is a girl. Arthur, look. We have a beautiful, courageous, intelligent daughter. We are truly blessed. Mom? Dad, thank you, thank you. I'm overjoyed to join thy family, but I have one small request, if I may. But of course, my angel. Can you find room in your heart to bring Tristan and Gavin into our home as my brothers? I've never had a family before, but the way they supported, cared, and protected me during the tournament felt extremely brotherly. I implore thee to make them my brothers forever, please. There's that magic word again. What a wonderful suggestion. My daughter, my sons, in one glorious day, Guinevere and I are no longer childless. 
we have a brave and beautiful daughter. And now we have two chivalrous sons as well. And would you listen to that? Music! The curse is lifted! <laughs> We've traveled so far from our home to here Encountered a troll who brought us great fear We defeated the troll to meet royalty And now we shall sing and celebrate Our admiration for thee Three cheers for King Arthur and Queen Guinevere! Huzzah! 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 They rule the kingdom with fairness and kindness. We thank you and your knights for your courage, your highness. Should we curtsy or bow or get down on one knee, we'll spin in a circle and jump up with glee. Curtsy, bow, down on one knee. Curtsy, bow, down on one knee. Curtsy, bow, down on one knee, we can finally sing and dance a lot to the music of Camelot. Three cheers for the three of you! Huzzah! 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 Your journey to Camelot has brought us all joy. You've blessed our dear family with a girl and two boys. Your courage and kindness and brave chivalry are reason to sing and celebrate in, in admiration, admiration of thee. We'll dance and we'll sing as we celebrate love For our families and friends and for all of each other Let's all curtsy and bow and get down on one knee Then turn in a circle and jump up with glee Curtsy, bow, down on one knee Curtsy, bow, down on one knee Curtsy, bow, down on one knee We can finally sing And dance a lot with the music of Camelot. <laughs> Let the dancers dance and the chorus all sing. Our perfect paradise is once more here and cared for by my wife, the beautiful Guinevere. <laughs> you have brought music back to the kingdom of Camelot and brought my queen and I the family that we've long been yearning for. We are forever in your debt. Thank you, your majesty, but we're the lucky ones. To be part of a legendary tale such as yours has been such an honor and so much fun. We've had so much fun visiting Camelot today, meeting all of you, becoming knights, and helping to break the curse. But I do miss my family and friends. I don't know about you, reader, but I'm ready to head home. We certainly understand. We're looking forward to time with our family as well. Know that you always have a place at our round table if you decide to return. Farewell, Sir Lauren the Loyal. Farewell, Sir Reading Bug the Reliable. Farewell, Sir Reader the Resolute. Farewell, King Arthur and Queen Guinevere. Farewell, Sabine the Small, Tristan the Tenacious, and Gavin the Gleeful. We'll miss you all, and we vow to return again. Okay, reader, are you ready for the trip back? Great! On the count of three, let's jump into my book bag together. One, two, three, jump! We've had a big adventure within our book bag, and I think we saved the day. We'll see you next time. Goodbye, book bag. Now it's time to fly away. Look outside, friends. If you look quickly, you can see the beautiful castle city of Camelot. And yes, in the mist behind the castle, there's an amazing rainbow spread from one side of the island to the other. It is the most beautiful rainbow I have ever seen, with all seven colors on the spectrum. On the very inside of the rainbow is violet, and then indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. And if you look close in the other direction, it looks like we're getting closer and closer to our homes in the 21st century. I'll never forget such a legendary adventure. Gavin, Tristan, and Sabine, King Arthur and Queen Guinevere, the knights, the castle, and the exciting contest. 
I can't wait to draw illustrations of all of it. If you enjoyed today's adventure like I did and want to have more royal adventures, you can find a list of books in my book bag at www.thereadingbug.com slash adventures. Look, reader, we're back! You made a terrific night of the round table. You showed bravery and chivalry, and you helped break the curse on King Arthur and Queen Guinevere's kingdom. When you're a reader, you're a leader. You're ready to learn about everything as you grow. You'll show this world that you can be anything. You could write a book or fly a plane. Build a house with a giant crane. Whatever you do, one thing will be true. There's nothing you can't do. You can see it through just by being you. Cause you're a reader, you're a leader You're ready to learn about everything as you grow You'll show this world that you can be anything You could sing your way into a Broadway show Don't let anyone tell you no Whatever you do, one thing will be true There's nothing you can't do You can make your dreams come true Just by being you Thank you for all your help, brave Sir Reader the Resolute. I can't wait to adventure with you again. But right now, my tummy is growling. That was an awfully long adventure. So, for now, it's back home for all of us, and I'll look forward to our next magical adventure together. Until then, Reader, goodbye. See you soon. It's a reading bug adventure. There's lots of fun in store. Just inside our book bag, there's new places to explore. Grab your crayons and paper, and your imaginations too. The Reading Bug and I can't wait to share our trip with you. Thank you for joining our adventure today. I'll begin playing coloring music in just a minute. And while you get ready to color some beautiful illustrations of all the things we saw and did on our adventure today, I have a few people to thank. Today's episode is sponsored by Random House Kids and their picture book, Grumpy Monkey, by Suzanne Lang. At the Reading Bug Bookstore, we all recommend Grumpy Monkey as a wonderful, funny, and important book, and we're thrilled to introduce it to all of our listeners. You can buy Grumpy Monkey at thereadingbug.com or your local independent bookstore. And find out more about Random House Kids books by visiting rhcbooks.com. Thank you, Random House Kids, for your support. And thanks to all of our individual sponsors as well. If you're interested in becoming a patron, please visit our page at patreon.com. Thanks for listening to Reading Bug Adventures. I'm Lauren Savage, and today's adventure was an original story written by Diane and Brandon Savage. This episode was performed by me, Chloe Savage, Brandon, Riley, Diane, and John Savage, Katie Kerwin Jelniak, Rosemary and Soren Hillsland, and by Rob DeCruz and Shannon Shern. Original music was written and performed by me and Alexa Thanos, and sound mixing and mastery was by Resonate Recordings. The Reading Bug is a family-owned, independent children's bookstore in California, and we're passionate about educating, entertaining, and engaging children of all ages. Learn more about us at thereadingbug.com and our personalized subscription service at readingbugbox.com. And please continue to support passion, expertise, and creativity in children's literature by shopping with us or other local independent booksellers wherever you can. Thank you.